Good morning, afternoon, and evening, and welcome everyone to Global Insights, a live, interactive, streamed panel discussion which sheds light on big questions currently facing planners, policymakers, and researchers worldwide. Global Insights brings together leading institutions of international affairs from across the world, including Warwick University in the United Kingdom, the Balsillie School in Canada, Ritsumeikan University in Japan, the Centre for International Governance and Innovation here in Waterloo, Canada, the Institute for Strategic Affairs in Addis Ababa University and the American University in Washington, DC. Today's live stream panel discussion is entitled, Who Decides? Misinformation and Election Interference. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's panel discussion. There are many of you in the audience today. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions that you would like to direct to the panelists, particularly during the la latter part of the session, we would ask you to use the Q&A function on your Zoom panel, and we will direct those questions accordingly. Before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those in the audience who are tuning in from outside of Canada, one of the actions we take to advance reconciliation between settler and indigenous peoples is to reflect on the land in which we sit and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts on our work. The Balsillie School of International Affairs is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River, which is on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. It is particularly important that he, we here at the school acknowledge the land upon which we are situated in all that we do. We are privileged today to ho host three very well-known experts on issues related to information, disinformation, uh, misinformation, and election interference. Scott Kogebrowers from the Graduate School of International Relations at the ritz University. After career in television news production in Japan and in the UK, Scott Kogebrowers now researches Japan's journalism and mass media industries. He has a particular interest in visual communication in news images. Aaron Schull is the Managing Director and General Counsel at the Center for International Governance Innovation. A practicing lawyer, Aaron Schull is CG's Managing Director and General Counsel, in addition to advising on a range of domestic, legal, and corporate matters. He has substantive experience in international law, global security, and internet governance. Jarena Thomas, Adjunct Pro Professorial Lecturer at the School of International Service at the American University in Washington, DC. Jarena has extensive experience in, in intelligence, analysis, intelligence-led investigations, and in homeland security issues. At the American University, she runs a practi practicum course on disinformation that focuses on helping the US government entities address the evolving use of information warfare by nation states. She has recently co-authored a tabletop exercise package developed to help state and local election officials, technology companies, media outlets and intelligence communities prepare for election related disinformation that may impact their work in the coming months. Thank you all of you for joining us today. It's wonderful to have you uh, particularly focused on such a timely and compelling issue. To all of you, I'd like to start with a general question about the terms misinformation, disinformation and elective election interference. We hear about these terms very often in the news. What do these terms actually mean? How do these things differ from what is considered to be traditional political campaigning? So Aaron, first question to you, please. What does interference in elections generally look like and how do foreign actors do it? Thanks, Anne. Uh, great to be with you. Um, there's probably four main ways that we should discuss. Uh, one is actually attacking the election infrastructure itself. And so that can involve a range of a range of um, uh, kind of surreptitious activity. But think about penetrating the voting system, 
uh, the voter databases, uh, mucking around with the IT infrastructure, um, that there's a whole range of tactics that I won't go into, but DDoS attacks and all that, that sort of stuff. Then you can actually have an attack on the campaign itself. And so this is the John Podesta thing, right? You actually hack the campaign, you leak emails, you, you, you try, and, um, try and undermine the efficacy of the actual campaign itself with a public release uh, that's usually timed very strategically. You can also disrupt uh, adjacent infrastructure. So think about going after state institutions. Uh, you could go after NGOs, media organizations, all with a view to um, just creating a bit of chaos around it. Um, and then the one we're, we're, we're really talking about is spreading misinformation and disinformation. And this has a booster shot because of social media. I mean, the propaganda is as old as countries, but what's new now is the speed uh, through which it can spread and just how venomous it can be because of behavioral targeting um, and, 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 and because of the AI stack running on a big data set. So those, are the, those would be the, the, the four big buckets. I mean, there's all sorts of other stuff like text messages and, and that, but the, the, the main ones that I think we need to be focused on are the ones I just enumerated. Thanks very much. Jarena, over to you. Why these days are misinformation and disinformation campaigns so effective? Thanks, Anne. Great to be here with you all. So I think they're so effective for a few reasons. So the first is that basically they play to the core elements of our human experience. So they either play on fear, fears that we have, they play on our desires or needs, or they play on the fact that we are not experts, that there's a lack of knowledge out there about certain issues. So for example, if we look at the disinformation and misinformation that has been very prevalent throughout this COVID pandemic, we see that it generally plays on one of these three core human elements. So our fear about what's going on, our desires and needs to be economically stable, to be healthy, um, to take care of our loved ones, or the fact that we just do not know a lot about this. This is new. Most of us are not you know, infectious disease experts. So we do have a, a lack of knowledge about what's going on. And so disinformation and misinformation can play to that and pull on some of those deep seated emotions. Also, I think our ingrained biases um, help us to be susceptible as humans to disinformation and misinformation. And these types of tactics use flawed logic to appeal to these deep seated emotions and deep seated thought patterns. And so that's why it has been so effective. And I do wanna note in relation to the elections that there is a surprising amount that is similar between traditional political campaigning in the US as we've seen it over the decades and misinformation and disinformation. They do have some things in common, which is a little unsettling. They, they both tend to use false and misleading information they both a lot of times focus on villainizing the other, the other candidate, the other party. And then a lot of times in both misinformation, disinformation and traditional political advertising, they um, use true information as a weapon against the other side. So there are some parallels which are interesting to study. And I think we can learn a lot from looking at, looking at them. Thank you. Scott, you're coming into us today from Japan and Japan has a general election coming up in 2021. What are some of the misinformation and disinformation concerns for you there in that part of the world? Uh, yeah, the, uh, hi Anne and everybody, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, Japan has, obviously the, the, the idea of fake news has entered Jap the Japanese lexicon, you know, as an, as an English term. Uh, and people are aware of uh, fake news and disinformation as an issue, but it's still uh, seen largely as an issue which is uh, which hasn't affected Japan yet. And indeed, there are you know no no uh, uh, documented incidences of of any kind of uh, foreign interference in, in elections in Japan over the past kind of five six years. Um, and this is partly because Japan has kind of insulated. Uh, from these problems uh, uh, due to the fact that its elections are uh, highly regulated by a law, the, the uh, public office elections law, which goes back to 1950s, uh, which has hardly changed. And therefore elections in Japan are still very, uh, I'm not sure if traditional is the word, but certainly their, their, their activities are very, very unchanged since the 1950s. Uh, there are concerns about identity theft, uh, uh, which were addressed partly by changes to the law in 2013, but uh, 
you know, it's still uh, not a great concern to uh, many people in Japan. One particular concern that, uh, that is beginning to appear is uh, worries around uh, the possibility of a change in government, uh, uh, possibly a, a kind of reinvigorated Liberal Democratic Party government after the next election, uh, embarking on uh, the final stage of its efforts to change the uh, Article 9 of uh, the Constitution, that's the kind of no war article, uh, which would require a referendum, uh, a, refer a national uh, scale referendum, and that would possibly be of interest to parties who would be interested in uh, affecting the outcome. So that's uh, the particular concern isn't really around general elections, uh, uh, but around possibly in the refer uh, a, gen a referendum in the next couple of years or so. Thank you. I'd like to talk about um, what some commentators are characterizing as a new type of warfare in the digital age, and that is of election interference. So, Jareen, I'd like you to comment. Is this, um, uh, you know, how do you characterize this? Is this purely a cybersecurity issue or not a cybersecurity issue? Different kind of warfare? Well, uh, great question. I think it is multifaceted. So, in large Part, yes, it's a cybersecurity issue because a lot of misinformation and disinformation is spread online. And so there are a lot of cybersecurity elements in there, but it's not a cybersecurity issue alone. It's also a sociological issue because as I mentioned previously, you know, a lot of the misinformation, disinformation plays on our thought patterns, our biases, um, our emotions, um, interpersonal and group dynamics. So in that sense, it's a sociological issue as well. Um, and we see that it is more prevalent in some countries than others based on what Scott just shared. So there's that piece of it. It's also an educational issue. There's a media literacy piece to this, understanding how, how, communicate, how mass communication works, understanding the tactics that are used are definitely educational issues. And so societies that focus on um, ch child education up to adult education that have a media literacy component recognize this. And so I definitely think that this is an educational issue as well. It's also technological, you know, the social media platforms, the AI, the artificial intelligence, the algorithms have a lot to do with amplifying this type of information. So there's a tech piece to that. And then lastly, of course, it's a democratic issue, you know, in terms of free speech, in terms of people being able to say, particularly in the US, you know, we're really big on free speech, First Amendment rights, you should be able to say what you want, whether or not it's true. So there's a democratic piece to that as well, and an ethical piece um, that needs needs to be explored as well. Thanks so much. Aaron, what are foreign actors trying to achieve by these tactics um, and in the light of this new digitalized warfare? Um, well, look, I mean, there's going to be different strategic reasons for different campaigns. And so in some instances, it could be to suppress a particular block of voters uh, turnout in order to give a candidate a boost here or there. Um, but I think we'll, or maybe I'll confine my comments to what I've seen related to the U.S. presidential election, because that's what's on everyone's mind. Uh, sometimes the simplest explanation is the best, right? They want to sow chaos. They want to sow division because if you can do that, then you can undermine the efficacy of that society, right? You can breed distrust. You can undermine confidence in democratic institutions. And sometimes that's just, that's enough, right? You don't need to, you don't need to do anything other than that. Um, basically you, you throw a match into the tinderbox and watch it burn. And that's what we're seeing right now, right? That's, that is, that is, I think the strategic motive of many of the, of many of the interference campaigns is simply to undermine confidence in the electoral process, to create distrust and to sow, and to sow division, because if the United States is not united, right, they're, they're not as powerful on the global stage. And that's, I think what we're looking at right now. Great, thank you. Scott, over to you. You're in Japan. It's a developed country. It's a, a, a democracy with a vital public sphere located in a very strategically um, geostrategic place in the world, particularly uh, politically located between the US and China. Why are we not seeing any of these issues and challenges and problems happening there? Uh, well, uh, as Aaron and Jarena just mentioned there, it's a, a multifaceted problem. and uh, an issue, uh, a partly a sociological one, as Jarena mentioned. Uh, another issue uh, that probably differentiates Japan and makes it, uh, let me see, a less, uh, a less appealing target to anybody who might want to 
try to exert this kind of influence, given the tools that have been used that we know about already. Uh, well, partly the, the, the very rigid legal framework about political campaigning that I mentioned previously, but also uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, the profile of social media use in Japan is quite different to other countries, which makes it, uh, I wouldn't say more resilient, or it is resilient by, by chance rather than anything else, rather than by design, but. Uh, so, for instance, nobody's mentioned Facebook yet, but Facebook uh, uh, usage in, uh, in Japan is relatively low. Uh, only about 5% of Internet users think of Facebook as a news source. Uh, if you contrast this with the US, where uh, close to 40% of, uh, of Internet users consider Facebook a news source, that obviously makes it very, very uh, different. Uh, new, uh, people who go online, information seeking activities online in Japan tend to be focused on aggregators. Uh, so news aggregators like Ga Yahoo News and Line News tend to be where people go. And those are not algorithmically driven, they are human driven, they are human editors, which makes them uh, inherently more kind of resilient when it comes to uh, dealing with the kind of uh, challenges that news organizations around uh, and societies around the world are facing at the moment. Thank you. Irina, the US election is next week. Um, it's on everyone's minds. The stakes have never been so high. And uh, there is concern, widespread concern, that the outcomes for the election may fall prey to misinformation and disinformation campaigns. So please, could you tell us um, where this disinformation and misinformation is coming from in the US context? Is it from international sources? How much, if any, is it from domestic sources? Yes, uh, thanks for that, Anne. So I can't say exactly, but I can say for sure that both are influencing the election and both are problematic. So we tend to, particularly after what happened in 2016, we tend to focus on the foreign interference because it's intriguing um, and it has these global implications, we feel violated, we feel indignant that another country, another government may interfere with our elections by um, misleading us or manipulating uh, the public discourse. And so that is what gets a lot of the attention. But I do think it's important for us to also pay attention to the domestic sources that are creating and pushing and promoting and amplifying um, misinformation and disinformation as well, particularly related to the election. Um, this is especially true when the domestic sources are people of power, people of influence. Um, it becomes particularly um, difficult to, to parse if this is true, if this is not, should I trust this source, should I not? Um, when things are, are domestic, internal to the US, we, they tend to get a nice little halo on them. And so um, I think it's something that we need to pay attention to as well and understand that yes, the Russians and the Iranians may be trying to manipulate the election, but just as bad as that is, we have internal actors who are doing the exact same thing. And I would argue that their influence, the internal actors influence can be just as bad or worse because of the fact that they are not the other, they're domestic. And so they, um, they may, there may be a, an, air, an aura of, of trust, of inherent trust that goes along with that, that makes it all the more, all the more um, tricky to, to manage, to identify and to manage. So Erin, let me just extend on this issue of foreign interference. Um, how, how big is this problem and how worried should, should we be about it? Um, we'll see, right? We'll see, um, we don't know. Uh, really, I think what it comes, like obviously there's, there's all kinds of it happening right now. The implications of it are not clear and what, what we're really gonna have to watch for uh, is how people interpret the results of the election. Right, whether or not they're deemed to be legitimate. And you know, there's also, I mean, there's the foreign influence campaign, but there's a whole bunch of self-inflicted wounds on this too, right? So like the, the president himself is doing his level best to undermine that, that confidence. And so you know, the, they say the call is coming from inside the house, right? So there's, there's that suite of issues then compounded with the foreign interference part of it. Um, we'll see. I, I, I mean, like, can we can we talk? Can we talk in a, in a couple of weeks and I'll have a better sense? Because if if those if the results of that election are deemed to be illegitimate by a large portion of the population and they take to the streets, um, all bets are off. Scott, how does the nature of politics and levels of political participation in Japan feed into this process? Uh, again, you know, I, I'm sorry to be the outlier here again. Uh, 
but Japan has kind of uh, been insulated uh, from these processes, partly by you know the, the the social media I mentioned, the use of social media uh, I mentioned before, but also uh, due to the simple fact, which you know uh, I don't want to seem rude, but Japanese people are generally not interested in politics. Um, uh, they politics in Japan just does not arouse the passion and interest of, uh, uh, of people as it does in other countries. Um, the reason for this is partly because of the stability of the system. Effectively, the Liberal Democratic Party has been in government more or less since 1955, apart from a few brief interludes. Uh, if you look at the, the demographics of voters uh, who vote for the LDP and who vote for other parties, they're pretty much identical. There are no real um, ideological ruptures uh, for anybody interested in, in kind of trying to skew or influence the uh, election. There are no real ruptures to uh, 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 to kind of um, uh, make use of. So, uh, you know, uh, turnout in Japan has been falling for the past three decades, e even amongst young people. Young, uh, 18 and uh, 19 year olds were given the vote a few years ago in an attempt to boost interest uh, among younger people in voting. But even so, you know, uh, voting rates amongst those uh, younger populations are generally between 30 and 50%, uh, depending on the election. So as Jarena mentioned, uh, the way these campaigns of influence seem to work is that they play on uh, the emotional attachment uh, that people have to their you know, political interests. In Japan, those emotional uh, attachments are fairly uh, thin, so there's not really anything to work with with these uh, kind of attentions, which means that, I, I, again, as I mentioned, you know, Japan is uh, pretty much insulated a lot of the time. So let me push back on uh, one issue there. Um, governments are not innocent bystanders in these processes. So um, what are they doing to try to combat these campaigns, especially in the Japanese context? We'll start with you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, uh, there is an acknowledgement uh, within the Japanese, you know, the, the Japanese government that these issues ultimately will probably come to affect uh, how politics functions and how elections function in Japan. Uh, and they have started to quite belatedly uh, to think about what kind of measures would be needed. So there was a, a committee to consider recommendations set up in the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications back in uh, late 2018. And it reported earlier this year, and you know its its recommendations look like the rec the kind of uh, measures taken in European countries. So the establishment of uh, oversight bodies and the establishment of uh, uh, fact checking institutions, things like this. Um, but you know it, it's. The, the problems that Japan faces, it, it seems to feel that the, the misinformation is not necessarily a political problem, it's more of a, a problem which is connected to things like uh, disaster relief or uh, information theft or uh, online defamation. So it's more concerned about those type of issues than it is with election interference. And this could again be because of, you know, the low levels of, uh, you know, a general interest in politics in Japan and, and because of the, uh, infam the, the, sorry, the legal structures, which really, really limit what people, uh, what parties and candidates and individuals can do during an election campaign. Thank you, Aaron. We knew about the Russian interference in the 2016 US election campaign. What measures are being taken by the US government um, based on your knowledge to combat this issue for this coming election next week? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's been all kinds of stuff that they've done. Um, and I would say they're, they're better prepared. Um, obviously top security agencies in the US um, have been working with uh, with corporate actors. Um, so the FBI, uh, as, a, an ex as an example, working in tandem with the NSA, uh, has tipped Facebook, Twitter, and others um, to the various fake accounts created by Russian operatives. Um, they've strengthened uh, various defenses. Um, they've declared the, for example, uh, they've declared the election system to be critical infrastructure, and there's a whole suite of activities that take place as a consequence of that. Um, uh, the NSA uh, and their military cyber operators have been working on uh, 
targeting Russian spies um, and uh, undertaking offensive uh, cyber campaigns against them, although that stuff is classified. So you only get snippets in the, in the media. So what they're actually doing, we don't really know, but you can assume that there's a whole bunch of that stuff happening. Um, there's the Elections Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center that's been set up in March of 2018. Um, there was an executive order uh, signed to impose sanctions uh, in the event of foreign interference. Um, the FBI, the uh, something called the, the CISA or the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and the DNI have been briefing candidates, parties, congressional intelligence committees. Um, and there's also, they're setting up a round the clock uh, command post for election day um, that's gonna be staffed by CISA and the FBI. So they're doing everything that they can as, as you know, as a government, uh, as government agencies uh, to try and secure the, inf the infrastructure and to try and um, hit the bad guys wherever they can. Um, but you know, nothing's perfect. Jorina, Jorina, you're sitting in Washington, uh, so you must feel the vibe down there. So tell us in your view, what can we do to prevent the insidious influence of these misinformation and disinformation campaigns? Sure. Well, uh, that rundown that Aaron gave was great. I mean, he hit on all the major points, all the big uh, things that the U.S. government is doing uh, the EI, the Elections Infrastructure ISAC, what CISA is doing, um, what the FBI is doing with the Countering Foreign Influence Task Force. Um, CISA has this great campaign called Hashtag Protect 2020. Um, it's really um, made for the average Joe uh, to be able to process what they're sharing. Um, they're teaching how to identify uh, potentially fake information, how to be media literate, all this stuff. So the campaign is great. The government is really, particularly FBI and CISA are really doing a lot to, to speak to the average person. So I will say when I look at, you know, what, what else we can do to work against this, I, I, I see it in different tiers. So just really quickly, I see at the individual level, we need to be self-aware people. I mean, that's not something the government can, can mandate. We need to be self-aware. We need to be, make ourselves aware of the tactics that are used. Um, we need to become healthy skeptics of what we read and what we watch and get into the habit of checking our information. So that's what I think on an individual level we can do. As for what the governments can do, um, in addition to what, what Anne has, sh has shared, I think that the US government can take a page from the book of what Finland has done and, and invest in and media literacy throughout the educational system on a regular basis. So not just when elections come around, but have media literacy in some capacity be baked into our educational system. I think that would really help so we can have a populace that's better steeled against bad information. I don't think that's a magic silver bullet, but I think it can help um, with for some people, not everyone. And then of course, uh, the last thing I'll note is that governments, technology companies, and other organizations can also just get in the habit of anticipating topics that are gonna be ripe for disinformation, particularly when major events come around like elections, like protests, like, like major other events that may happen, and then prepare for those. So just make sure that they're constantly reviewing their policies um, in terms of replying to disinformation and then also having some narratives already drafted up practically ready to go when they can anticipate that that um, major issues are going to are going to attract false information and be prepared with that on the front end because the hard part about disinformation is when it's already out there it's already in people's minds so a lot of times the more time you wait to address it the more it's, it's filtering through the more people get it the more credibility it may get so being able to respond proactively or almost immediately if you can what you can anticipate would be helpful Okay, so it's, it's not an exaggeration that this election interference risks undermining democracy. And are democratic societies really resilient enough to withstand these effects? So Scott, I'd like um, you to comment, if you will, on what happens with levels of trust across social institutions and media uh, across Japan. It seems as though we've got some good practice and positive lessons to learn from Japan. So anything you can share on that front would be helpful. Uh, yeah, it's, it's strange. I, when I was making my notes for this, uh, uh, I kind of uh, uh, facetiously noted down that per perhaps not caring so much about politics is the answer. Uh, certainly there is uh, a, I mean, the, the picture I get of, uh, of 
uh, of uh, uh, trust, trust and the relationship between voters and government in Japan is that there is a, uh, a disconnect between uh, people's experience of politics, what people think about politics, people, politics in, everyday, people, in people's everyday lives and government. Uh, a lot of people are certainly under 30 don't really see uh, diet members as representing them. So they don't really feel connected. Uh, they don't generally know a lot about policy. They don't really feel kind of passionate about any about uh, issues that translate into uh, policy discussions within the government, which tend to be, you know, uh, very, very dry, uh, very, very bland for most people. Um, in addition to that, a lot of people uh, don't really see the government in Japan as having uh, responsibility for areas that is quite surprising. Uh, the uh, ISSP survey last year uh, compared people's thinking around in, in countries around the world on the role of government in various issues, so for instance in promoting gender equality or dealing with unemployment, and it's shocking almost to see how what, what, uh, so what a small proportion of, uh, of Japanese respondents regard those as being uh, somehow the responsibility of government. So there seems to be a, uh, a, a quite a disconnect between uh, people's everyday lives and, you know, and the actual governing of the country. Um, in terms of mass media, uh, I think Japan is similar in, a, in, a, in an exaggerated way, if you like, to lots of other countries. People still get most of their information about politics uh, from the traditional mass media. So newspapers are still very, very strong in Japan. Uh, television, uh, television news is still the most trusted outlet. So NHK news is by far the most trusted outlet for news. And uh, people's use of social media, as I, I said, is quite different to other countries. Uh, so while uh, if you look at figures generally for trust in these kinds of institutions, they are fairly low and have been low for a long time. We haven't really seen any major changes over the past 20 years uh, because uh, in Japan, re uh, kind of um, uh, trust in these kinds of issues has been low for quite a long time. So the impact of uh, social media and misinformation has actually been fairly negligible. So Jarena, we've seen um, misinformation and disinformation in US elections for decades, right? What is so different now uh, compared to former years? Sure, so I would say two main things. So the first in the US, in contrast to what, what Scott has shared about Japan, is the ubiquity of social media use as people's primary news source. It, it's, it's shocking to me how many people use uh, Facebook or Twitter as their primary news source and they tell you something off the wall and you say, oh, well, where'd you get that? Oh, on Facebook. <laughs> so as though it was, it was they were citing a, a, a primary news source. And so I, I use that example to say that I think that that's the case with a lot of people here. Um, so it's convenient, it's easy. Um, so it's fed to you. So I think that's one of the issues. People use it as a primary news source and it's so easily, and, and because they do that, it's so easily to be, it's so easy to manipulate people on social media um, to play their biases. You know, the news that they get is um, a built by algorithm. It, 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 it learns from what they've liked in the past and it feeds them more of that. So that's one. The second is how polarized the US is. I don't think it'll come as a surprise to anyone for me to say that. Um, we've been polarized in the past. There have been lots of controversial major issues that have shaken up the populace in the past. But in the last eight years, I would say, we've been shifting further and further and further into these two major camps. And so people tend to have strong, extremely strong feelings about one party or the other, one candidate or the other. And I think that when that is the case, um, the, our politics reflect that very strongly. And so it makes people susceptible, you know, the whole deal with confirmation bias, you know, we, we like to get more of the information that we already believe that supports our own biases. And so when, you when you're in these two camps and you feel very strongly one way or another, when you get information 
whether or not it's true, whether or not it's accurate, that confirms your beliefs and your strong feelings, you tend to latch onto that and it makes you susceptible and easily easier to be manipulated. And so I think that that's the situation we're in right now. It's like the perfect storm. This reliance on social media for news and this very polarized uh, situation in which we find ourselves uh, has made us very susceptible. And that's why we are where we are right now. Thank you. Erin, tell us your views on um, what social media companies are doing to mitigate against uh, interference. Sure, yeah, I just want to come back to what um, Adrania said there. I think it was good, right? Yeah, the Russians didn't invent racism and social division in 2016. They just leaned on it with the aid of technology, right? And so there is a, there's a, there's got to be a much bigger conversation to be had um, and a lot of, I think, a lot of healing. And uh, I'll just I'll plug a book by Amy Chua, who's a scholar at a Yale University called Political Tribalism. I think it does a good job of explaining what, what uh, Adrania was talking about there. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, okay, so uh, not all platforms are created equal. They're all doing different things. We tend to lump them together for the ease of uh, ease of conversation, but I'll talk about Facebook, I'll talk about Twitter, I'll talk about YouTube, I'll talk about TikTok, and I'll talk about Pinterest. So uh, Facebook took the most heat in 2016 for sure. Um, and so what they've done is they've banned political ads uh, in the week leading up to November 3rd. I mean, so that's that's one thing. I don't whether that's adequate is a whole other conversation. Um, and it will pro prohibit um, uh, or put, it'll put warning labels on content that seeks to undermine the outcome of the election. Um, and they won't let candidates to, to declare victory um, unilaterally kind of on their own before uh, before um, uh, it goes through Reuters or the national elect election pool. Um, and they also removed a whole bunch of content um, it, in particular from March to July. They, they pulled out about over 100,000 pieces of content. But here's the rub. They don't fact check politicians, right? Um, or their posts or their ads like Twitter does, um, is, even when there's false claims. And they say, well, or Zuckerberg said, well, we don't want to impinge on free speech. So, you know, politicians going to lie, you know, let them lie. Um, Twitter has a civic integrity pro, uh, policy, and it will take it will take stuff down uh, if it violates that, um, and especially if there's any content uh, regarding you know um, uh, civ like civil transfer of power or uh, trying to undermine peaceful transfer of power, they'll pull that. Um, they'll also label stuff if it's misleading. Um, or if there's a mischaracterization and they won't promote it as well. Um, and so, so that's kind of what we're seeing. And then you've also seen that policy tested by the president, right? A whole bunch of times, um, you know, talking about misleading uh, information about voter ballots and mail-in voting and sharing manipulated video and actually inciting violence. And so, so there's a, like that, you know, that's, that's one kind of suite of issues. Uh, YouTube uh, will remove uh, posts um, that, uh, that are fake and that mislead people about about where to go on election day. Um, there's a whole other problem because a lot of people live stream on YouTube. And so, you know, how, how do they catch that content, especially if people are mixing it in with their, with their regular programming. Um, and so uh, TikTok, um, they're, uh, they're, uh, fact, they're entering into fact checking partnerships um, and they're trying to block synthetic or manipulated content. And Pinterest just straight up banned all political advertising in 2018. So you can see there's various approaches being taken by the platforms and they're not, they're not equal across them. Thank you very much. Um, there's questions coming in from the different feeds uh, out in the audience. So I'd like to turn to those now. Um, uh, Jorina, one from you on QAnon. Um, let's just read this here. QAnon has become an important variable in the US election in part because it is becoming more and more mainstream. How can governments neutralize something like QAnon? Hmm. That's a really good question. How the US government can, I can only speak for the US government, um, how they can, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if, if they would be able to, honestly. But I think the media, the established media companies can. I think that uh, reputable media outlets like the Washington Post that has its fact checker, fact checker does a great job of, of being very objective and looking at some of the claims that QAnon and other similar groups promote and just giving it a straight up or down. Is this true? Is there evidence of this or is there not? Um, so they do a really good job of that. I know a lot of people look at an established paper like the Washington Post and say it's very left leaning, but there are other, you know, if you don't like the Washington Post, there are other fact checking organizations um, within the media landscape that, that provide this service. And so I would, I would lean on them as opposed to the US government, because the US government has a really fine line to walk. 
you know, as we talked about free speech and impinging on people's rights, people are very sensitive about that type of stuff. So even the appearance that the government is trying to shut down people's right to share opinions or theories um, will not go over well. So, but I think the media has a good part to play, particularly with, with bringing true bringing true facts to the public discourse um, to debunk some of the QAnon theories that are being promoted out there. And it is dangerous because it is becoming very mainstream. I think we just saw a candidate, I think it was in the state of Virginia who was elected, um, who has openly promoted these QAnon theories. So um, I think the media has a, a big part to, to, to play and can help with that. Thank you. Erin, question about um, international conventions and international treaties. In fact, there's, there's a couple of questions on this. Do you foresee uh, the likelihood of such a convention or treaty being convened by the international community against disinformation and misinformation, just in the same way that we've seen these things on uh, address issues like climate change and other issues of global concern? Yeah, um, I hope so. But uh, no one has ever accused international lawyers of moving too fast on anything, right? So to bring the international community together to, to marshal a treaty, um, I think is, is um, you know, optimistically speaking, a way off. Um, what I think you'll like will be more likely is um, looking at countries that are working in collaboration with one another to set up like uh, comparable regulatory structures. Because at the end of the day, an international treaty binds countries, but those countries then have to enact domestic law. Right, they have to receive those international obligations into their, their domestic system. I think we'll see that a lot more informally uh, to start things out. And there's some work that CG has been doing with something called the International Grand Committee of Parliamentarians. That might be the um, where the, where the, there's a seedling there that could bl bloom into something else. But the idea of a comprehensive, uh, full full stop disinformation treaty uh, proceeding at the global level is just not, especially too, when countries are purposefully doing it, right? They, they like they like the ambiguity. The Russians love the ambiguity, right? They're not gonna sign onto a treaty like that, right? So geostrategic interests, when you talk about international law, you can't divorce it from international politics. Thank you. Um, Scott, the question specifically about Japan, uh, which comments that over the past dec few decades, the LDP and extremely right-wing actors in Japan have sought to reconstruct the war narrative, dismissing Japanese crimes against humanity, including the issue of comfort women. So in your view, the question is, is misinformation, disinformation not an issue in terms of right-wing revisionist Japanese politics playing upon Japanese apology fatigue? Uh, it probably is, and that's that's the one area where Japan does have a uh, let me see uh, uh, a misinformation disinformation problem. It's around activities of organisations like the uh, what's called the uh, Zaidokukai, which is a kind of right wing uh, anti Korean organisation, uh, and a lot of these you know a lot of these revisionist. Uh, movements and uh, are related to uh, Japan's feelings towards Korea and towards its neighbors and trying to, well, uh, let me see, reassess or review or change views on uh, Japan's war, uh, wartime responsibilities. So yeah, that is, a, a, that is where Japan's kind of online uh, What's the word? Uh, it's it's not quite Q and on, but it's where uh, Japan's online uh, problems are is in that kind of area. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not an, an expert on that, but that's certainly a concern for uh, people looking at uh, Japan's online communities. Great, thank you very much, um, Jarina. Back to you on Instagram, if I may. This is um, for some of the members of the audience another platform where a lot of misinformation and conspiracy theories spread, especially amongst young people and women. So, um, as the owner of Instagram, what is Facebook doing about this in your eyes? You know, I am actually not up to date on what Facebook is doing on its Instagram platform. So I'm going to have to leave that for someone else. I don't want to say anything that I'm not fully, fully up on. No, no problem at all. Let me go to another question. And Erin, I'll come to you on, on this Instagram one, if I may. But um, for you, Jarena, Congressman Schiff uh, stated a few weeks ago that the U.S. is not ready to defend itself against China's sharp power projection via disinformation campaigns. 
And even more recently, President Xi signaled that he was unwilling to tolerate further US hegemony in his nationalistic 70th anniversary of the Korean War speech. Should we lo be looking out for Chinese interference in this uh, and future elections? Sure. So uh, my, my practicum class this, this past semester actually looked at uh, partially what China was doing in the, the disinformation and foreign influence game in relation to the US election and wider US issues. Um, so China has some somewhat sophisticated uh, disinformation campaigns going on, uh, maybe not as sophisticated as what Russia has done, but nonetheless, something to look at. So I would say yes, I think that China is a country that we should not take our eye off of at all. China has very long-term strategic goals and um, is using a lot of different tactics to achieve those goals. And I think that using disinformation tactics and, and um, uh, manipulation campaigns is one of them. And so I definitely think that um, we should continue to look at, and I know that our, our, our intelligence agencies are continuing to look at the, the strategies and tactics that China is using in this realm. Thanks very much. Um, Scott, uh, could you comment on the following question? Is debunking misinformation actually the most effective way to counter it, especially in a highly polarized and emotional political environment? What happens when facts don't seem to matter to people? Uh, that's a really good question. It's kind of fundamental, isn't it? Um, uh, as, as I think we've mentioned a couple of times, a lot of the effectiveness of the kind of campaigns we saw, so 2016 in the US, uh, the uh, Brexit uh, uh, in the UK, these are not necessarily uh, rational arguments which are being made. They're often very, very emotive arguments, um, which cannot necessarily be countered by uh, presenting bare facts and statistics. So uh, it's, it's a really, really difficult problem. Uh, I, I, again, it's, you know, as, as Jorina has mentioned, and we mentioned before, uh, probably some kind of uh, more integrated education in media literacy and probably statistical literacy will go some way to, uh, you know, giving people the confidence to uh, uh, engage in rational discussion and, and not relying on emotional reactions in these kind of situations. But that's a solution which is, is decades away. Uh, and obviously the problems that we're facing in, or countries are facing around the world is a very, very immediate problem. And uh, I, I have honestly no idea what the, uh, what the solution is, I'm afraid. Aaron, let's come to you with that question about Instagram. What's Facebook doing? Uh, sure. So um, kind of similar to what I said regarding Facebook more generally. So uh, they've got third party fact checkers. Um, and then w w if there's something that's identified as false or misleading, it'll get labeled. It'll be harder to find. Um, they won't uh, they won't uh, spread it around, but they'll just they'll, they'll mark it um, as, with a false information warning. But again, going back to what I said earlier about not fact, fact checking politicians, uh, they don't do that. So anything that's coming from a political leader uh, doesn't get fact checked and doesn't get doesn't get stamped. And obviously, given the current climate that we're in, you know, one could probably take umbrage with that. Um, but that's that's the, the what, what's happening over there. And questions also on uh, social media companies that may be private and as of now not tethered to the First Amendment in the US. Uh, is it appropriate in the broader sense for these companies to deem political information true or false? So the concept of fact check is also not immune to disinformation. For example, if a politician um, says outrightly, there were 1500 instances of something but there were only 14 instances, 1400 instances, would that not be true enough? So given that, in your eyes, Jarena, is there a movement to build up a set of standards for what constitutes truth? And if not, what could form the conceptual basis for such a standard? <sighs> 
Well, <laughs> I short answer, I do not know. I mean, because you're nothing's going to be foolproof, kind of going back to what Scott said, nothing's going to be foolproof, because it, as long as you have people who are reacting to or susceptible to emotive type of content, um, they're not going to be swayed by, by anything. And so even if, even if you have a nice set of, of airtight standards, there's there are going to be ways to get around that and say, but, or, you know, we have this concept of what aboutism, you know, here. So you'll, there, I think that setting a standard for what's true and what's not um, is going to be hard, if not impossible in, in this particular case. But I do think the social media companies do have some type of social, um, social good responsibility, just like we talk about, com you know, um, companies in general, that they have a, a social uh, responsibility component to their work to give back to the communities that they, that they take from or that they benefit from. I think social media companies do as well. So I think that it, it behooves them to try to come up with some sort of loose standard, um, but to try to come up with uh, an airtight standard across the board for any type of speech is going to be difficult, if not impossible. So I don't even think it's worth the effort to do so. Thank you, Scott. Question coming in about a Japanese culture in particular, what is the role of print media, newspapers, journals, and magazines in Japanese society today? Um, do they play a role in shaping public awareness um, in, in Japan uh, more so than they do in the US? Uh, does that shape the nature of its elections in any way? Uh, well, I, I think uh, if you compare circulations uh, of newspapers, yeah, the actual physical newspapers, so dead tree newspapers uh, in uh, the US and, and most European countries, uh, Japan is still uh, uh, a, a huge newspaper country. Uh, circulations for the biggest dailies are in the kind of eight, you know, five, six, seven, eight million, uh, which is, you know, uh, still still far greater than, than most Western European countries. And they are widely trusted. Uh, I mentioned before the NHK, the National Broadcast, the, the news service is the most trusted news source in Japan. But after that, uh, the Omiuri newspaper, the Asahi, the Nikkei especially, are, are very, very broadly trusted. And although they are often described as being the Omiuri is more right wing, the Asahi is more left wing, et cetera, et cetera. The, you saw the, 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 the space between them, uh, if you like, the kind of degree of polarization in Japan is very, very small. Uh, and uh, they are generally uh, kind of, they are generally seen to be trustworthy, partly because they don't have a very, very strong political flavor to them. Um, this is unlike a lot of the, the magazine press, uh, the weekly news magazines, which are a kind of mixture of uh, more trashier stuff, uh, along with some really, really excellent journalism, which makes them very, very strange and embarrassing to buy. Uh, but the, the print media in Japan is still uh, relatively strong, I think, certainly by comparison to, to my home country in the UK, and I think in the US as well. Thanks very much. Aaron, a couple of questions coming in on examples of digital media, media strengthening the democratic process and strengthening democratic elections. Could you give your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I would say this, the amount of information that's available to uh, the electorate now has never been higher. Uh, their ability to understand and learn about issues has never been higher. And the facility with which they can access that information has never been higher. And at the end of the day, there has to be a conversation about individual responsibility here, right? I, you know, I think we talked about the frailty of human psychology and, you know, behavioral nudging and all of that stuff. So I, you know, I don't discount those things. But at the end of the day, the individual has to walk in and cast a ballot, right? And so there is, there's that, that is, that is the, the power that comes with democracy is your ability to decide, is your ability to choose. And that is both the best part and the worst part about democracy, but it comes down to individuals. And so I would say in terms of strengthening the civic discourse, the, the answer is that we now have access to all the relevant information at our fingertips. It's really just up to the individuals whether or not they decide to learn for themselves and whether or not they, they wish to cal cast a ballot based on the, either uh, based on that information and that analysis. Thanks very much. Uh, Yurhina, there's questions about um, how historians might describe this era 
of disinformation election interference in the future. So in your view, what will the footnote read? The footnote will read, <laughs> it's amazing that we're still here. <laughs> um, I don't know, that's, that's such a creative question. Um, I think that looking back on this era, we're going to see a lot of stuff that we can't see right now that we're right in the midst of it. And so I think historians will have the benefit of looking at all of the macro and micro issues that were impacting this, this era right now. And so since we're right in the middle of it, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to say what, what that footnote would say, but I do think it would be something very comprehensive um, and something probably a little dark. <laughs> and hopefully historians, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now will be in a much better place in terms of public discourse, in terms of media literacy, um, and in terms of, of the democratic process. Thanks, Scott. Quick question, quick answer on this, if, if you can. Um, questions about how is Japan viewing the whole US election, uh, elections, and, and what, what, you know, what's the general view out there? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I, I can only speak as a, as a TV viewer and newspaper reader, but yeah, I mean, J Japan is always keenly interested in the outcome of American elections. You know, Japan, uh, America is Japan's primary strategic partner. Uh, and so who is in the White House is a, is a vital interest. Uh, obviously, this election has been different. Uh, is possibly the word, maybe the polite word to use. Uh, uh, and to some, but, but the Japanese media is very, very serious uh, and very, very, uh, I think I used the word dry before, but it's very reluctant generally to uh, comment on, you know, any odd behaviors or uh, that it might see in uh, foreign politicians. It's very, very dry and uh, straightforward. So yeah, there's a keen interest and you know, it's uh, the regular updates on uh, polls and things like this, but uh, you know, uh, uh, as I say, there is not a lot of uh, in-depth analysis in the most trusted uh, news programs. On the sort of comment programs, the afternoon comment programs, the occasional Sunday programs, there is, you know, a uh, discussion of uh, President Trump's uh, his possibilities and the you know, you know the kind of possible changes that might come about if it's a Biden administration, uh, but certainly the primary concern is uh, you know this 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 uh, cross Pacific relationship and and, and the uh, uh, you know w will America come to the rescue of uh, come to Japan's rescue when China starts grabbing islands? That's the primary concern. I'm sure. Quick spin around the table. Um, we've got some policymakers in the audience. So, Jorhina, let's start with you. What is your top tip to the policy world in trying to address this issue? Uh, top tip, I would say, uh, let's be observe. Let's be keen observers of 2016, 2020. Let's do some comparison and contrast when this all is over in January, February timeframe, that's <laughs> my guess. Um, do some comparisons, contrasting, see what we what we can pull out, and then um, work across government with this with do to develop kind of a whole of society approach to um, disinformation, misinformation in relation to our elections um, so that we can be even more prepared, having been armed with two election cycles, two major election cycles worth of data that we can use um, going forward to 2024. Thanks very much, Scott. Top tip to the policy world. Sorry, I would I would say that in the in the long term uh, education, uh, there's been talk of media literacy, and I would like to see media literacy uh, as an integrated part of education. Uh, you know, from a fairly early age, because ultimately, you know, uh, as as Aaron has said. It's about individual responsibility. So I think it's up to us, you know, as educators, uh, to ensure that the the, the you know young people uh, uh, within our societies have the necessary skills to uh, evaluate information and to uh, make uh, reasonable choices based on the best information they can access. So yeah, invest in media literacy. Thanks very much, Aaron. Finishes us off. 
Sure. Um, so two things are worth mentioning, but they'll come back to the same general principle, which is uh, working together across borders. So the thing I said about legislative harmonization, I know that that's pretty dry stuff, but that's going to have to happen, right? These are global companies that we're talking about. So we need to have a harmonized legislative and regulatory approach across borders. Um, so that's point number one, but also working in concert with allies because there's has, there has to be a bill for this, right? Meddling in someone's democratic process is not safe. It's incredibly destabilizing. And I, you heard Joe Biden saying, well, Russia will pay, but what? What will they pay? How will they pay? And how will you act in concert with allies? We need to have a transparent discussion about this because this is functioning in that gray zone just below armed conflict. Um, so what is, what is that bill going to look like when it comes due and who's asking for it and how are you working with allies? So international collaboration on those two points, I think, would be welcome. Thanks so much to all of you. It's been a fantastic session, timely issue indeed. And in fact, next week at the same link, same time, um, and same thing, we have uh, a very timely topic entitled the global impact of the US election with international commentators. Please join us and please join me in thanking these four terrific panelists. Thanks very much. Take care and stay safe.